So I was trying to figure out what I was going to talk about today. <clears throat> and during Arabic class yesterday, um, I realized, or oh, I came up with the idea of what I should talk about today. And it's about Al Islam, the natural religion. <coughs> so it, it is my belief that if you or someone, a person or a group of people get together and think they could come up with the natural religion of Al Islam, this is how people before time were Muslims and ultimately how people, when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam, came to them, they said they were Muslims already, but they were not Mukmin. So I'll see if I can elaborate on that. But this is to show that Al Islam is a natural religion, a natural way of life for us. Uh, it is something that if we ponder over, we can realize the truthfulness in it. And this is why when people become Muslims, they are so at ease and they are so one in nature and at peace with themselves for accepting Al-Islam. Al-Islam says this life is a test for us. Now, people are normally distressed or distraught when they are, uh, have a test and they haven't studied for it. They don't know the answers to it, but you are at ease and at peace when you understand the test and you have all the answers to it. So I believe that Al-Islam is a natural religion for humanity, for everything of Allah's creation, so I'm going to see if I can articulate that today. I have a bunch of Arabic words on here. I'll see if I can um, explain what they mean and if they help me to articulate the uh, message that I'm trying to send today. So the first part I'm going to start off with will be a little bit uh, counterintuitive to what I'm saying. I'm suggesting that this is a natural religion, but a natural religion starts with a supernatural being, right? So, the first word I have up here is Al-Kitab. So Allah, this is an attribute of Allah. It comes from the root word Fatara, which means to create from nothing, to begin to create. So Allah is the creator, he is the originator, he is the one who began creation. So in science, it is called the first call, so the first creator. So no one or no being created Allah. Allah created creation. So creation did not exist until he existed also, or until he began to create. Also, there was nothingness. There was no things. And then Allah created things. So everything that he created was, in that instance, submitting to his will. So... As we understand in science that the universe is 13.8 billion years old, right? And they calculate this from the static in the universe and they conclude that there was initially, what, 13.8 billion years ago, there was a big bang or big explosion. As articulated in the Quran, it was one piece or one single singularity is what they call it in science. And then it began to split and expand and the universe expanded from there. So before that time, it did not exist. So what I'm saying about a natural religion is that it is natural in that it is um, congruent with our understanding and in harmonious with our understanding and any further understanding. So if you were to sit in a cave or sit at your house and think all day, and I mean, even if you were, if you understand your own humanity and you realize like I have underneath this kufi, I'm getting all kinds of gray hairs, I'm getting older, um, I don't recuperate or recover like I used to. I realize my own mortality, which means that there was a beginning and ultimately there is an ending for me. And if we go back in time, let's say for instance, this universe is expanding. So if we go back in time, at one point it was a singularity. So you don't necessarily need a scientist to tell you that, even though that's what scientists say. I think the, the uh, scientist's name was Bill Bryson who said, there was nothingness, and then there became there was something, and that became an explosion. So there was no thing. There was not time or space, and then the universe came into existence, and then it began to expand. So again, that root word there, I think I put it underneath there, or I put it here. That's what I means to create from nothing and to begin creation. And from this word, we get the word fitra, 
something that I want to expound upon, upon a little bit later, but we understand, Muslims understand what our fitrah is. It is our predisposition, something that we are naturally born with. Now, the reason I thought it was um, relevant to mention the Creator and the name, one of the names of Allah is the Creator and created from nothing, is that there are people who say that they are kinds of God, or they are small gods, or that they are God themselves, particularly because they believe that uh, because the woman or black woman is the first woman, and then from her everyone came, so they say she is God. Well, they say black human beings are God because from everyone, or from them, everyone else came. But the confusion, again, is that it, Allah is saying that he created things from nothing, not that there was something, and then they molded some things. So, for instance, I saw, an, uh, I saw a debate where a brother was saying that he was a kind of God because he could shape and mold things in clay or with wood or something to that effect. But that is the word that I have here for kulik. So Allah is also al kulik in that, and it comes from the word kulika, means to measure, to uh, to put in proper fashion, to form a thing. And it's not to be confused with the first word, which means to come from nothing. So in order to measure something, you need something there to measure, and you need a measuring tool. When Allah created from nothing, so a human being can shape and mold things, but he cannot be one who creates from nothing. And this is what we understand with uh, the first, I mean, this first attribute that I want to talk about, which is the creator and the originator. It's kind of like the difference between the connotation of the word made and created. You can say that you made a car from metal and rubber, but you don't say you created a car. Uh, uh, ultimately, people don't use it in that sense. If you look in a dictionary, it probably, probably would have words that articulate that, but ultimately, created gives us the connotation of something that was made from nothing. And this is exactly what Allah did. He created it from nothing. So from there, Allah did fashion human beings. Uh, scientists suggest that there were stars in the universe that exploded or imploded. And those uh, particles from those stars landed on the earth. And everything that is on the earth, all the elements of the earth, is what creates our human body. So we can understand this easily through animals. If you see an animal that is dead, they decompose right back into the ground. The same is true of a human being. <clears throat> if they weren't in a casket and we let them lay on the ground, ultimately the, the ground would, they would dissolve back into the ground because we are the elements of this earth. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if you had all of the elements and put them together, whether it was a certain amount of iron and sulfurous and nitrogen and oxygen that makes a human being, you can't mold them together to make a human being. There is something about us, in us, that is unseen, which is, in the Quran, they use the word, <coughs> see if I put it up here. Oh, uh, the word is gaib, but it, the uh, root word for it is gaiba, right? This word means to go away, to be removed, to be hidden, to be secret, to be unseen. It also means to hit a hidden reality and intimacy. Excuse me, which I thought was a, a very distinct definition in that our souls is our true intimate selves, in that it is our true selves, our real selves. When this, when this human body gets old and frail, it is not what really is us. Uh, our human body, our physical body doesn't love, it doesn't hate, uh, it is our souls that is actually doing this, or experiencing this life. Another reason, another way to determine that there obviously is something that is unseen is that our thoughts, so I mean, let me just say the definition, let me finish with the definition, because it's, the next part it says is the unperceivable, unperceivable by ordinary senses, so our five senses, which is seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, or hearing, yet we know, we know that we have a soul. How is that the case? How is it that there are some things that are unseen so in the definition in the Quran, it says unseen, but it's more than unseen. It's something that we can't perceive with our five senses. But there is another sense of knowledge and understanding in which we understand that there is something in us that makes us human beings. I saw my, my uh, uncle in his passing. He was in a hospital, and this man was like so full of life. 
And then I saw that body and I knew that that was not him. That's when I realized for sure that, that we have a soul. You could see that that was just a shell of the human being that he was. But another thing is our dreams and our thoughts are immaterial. Doctors and scientists can tell us when we're having a dream, but they can't tell what that dream is. Right now, I can perhaps think that you are thinking, but I have no idea what you're thinking. And no one knows except you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, that is something that is unseen, that is not perceivable by anyone else's basic, ordinary senses. You are the only person that knows this because it is the human being in you, the soul in you, that understands your thoughts and your thought processes. So again, this is something that is true if we just think about it. So ultimately, if you were to, again, sit in a cave somewhere and think, you would know that there is something more to you than your physical self. The next thing is the guru that Allah puts into man. I mean, I think I put the root word up there. Also, Raha, right here, right? So I'm practicing my Arabic, so I'm doing this with y'all also, <laughs> right? So that way in class, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do better. Because <laughs> my, uh, my oldest son is making me look very bad. I told him by the end of this year, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, make him look bad. So my, my, my middle son here is also working. He's trying to catch up with me. I'm not that good anyway. So I'm practicing now. So bear with me. So the definition of raha is to go or to do a thing in the evening. It's the first definition. The other one is a wind or a power. In this definition, in the Quranic dictionary, it also has uh, dominance and predominance. So predominance means superior strength, influence, or authority. It says also the soul or the breath of life. This is what Allah puts into human beings to make us alive, to make us uh, animated. There are inanimate objects in the world, like a rock. So for instance, the other thing is that, like I said, we are elements of this earth. So therefore, we are a molded. So Allah molded us from, this, from this, uh, this, this clay. And then he made us animated. So he gave something to us that made us able to think and talk and breathe and all those things. And the ability to change things and do things that other things cannot do. So Allah has given us this power. It's also what I might consider a force or an energy. And so when people say that, you know, you think about the power of Allah, if we are the elements of the earth, we are walking, talking clay and dirt. So Allah absolutely has the ability to make anything animated that he wants to make animated. So we know in the hereafter that our hands, our bodies will be testifying against us, right? So. How is that so? But Allah can create what he wills and animate what he wills. So our own testimony for or against us will be our bodies, our true se our, ourselves testifying against our true selves. So from the raw, there's the nafs. I think I put that up here somewhere also. <clears throat> A nafs here. So it comes from the word nafasa. Nasa, nafasa. Here's my, uh, this is my co-student here. So this is what I, I want to let, let him know that I'm working hard in Arabic, so I'm writing these things up here just to uh, kind of sharpen my skills. So nafasa, it means, the, the root word means to be precious, to request, it's your soul or your person, what Sigmund Freud might call the id, it's ourselves, our spirit, our minds, our inner desires or feelings. This is your real, the real you. It's also in it, it says, uh, breathing and breath in connection with our bodies. So I would suggest this is the, the kinetic energy, what moves us. What it's, it, also, it always seemed to me like the analogy would be a, a person in a car. Our bodies is the car, and the real true self is our soul, our spirit that is within us and traveling this world. So why exactly would it be traveling this world except for a, an adventure, a, a test, a something to find out, a journey to find out why you're here and what your purpose is. <clears throat> so if someone, again, if they pondered over this, if they sat and thought to themselves that I was created from a creator and he gave me, gave me a soul and he gave me a body and he is to understand why he gave that body, again, this is still what I believe is the natural religion of, of human beings and it would ultimately come to these conclusions. So ourselves, our soul, our nafs, 
has this fitra, which I was talking about pre previously, which means Allah created us from nothing, and when he created us, he created us with a predisposition. He created us with a natural constitution, and that constitution is towards peace and justice. So we have a consciousness, or we have a conscience. Our conscience is something that we are born with, which directs us in the, in the path of righteousness, of being fair, of being just. So Allah fashioned us in this mold when he created us, and, and he created everything. So this is what, what uh, hit me yesterday when we were in Arabic class, is that <clears throat> the teacher had us look up the root words for al-Islam, for iman, for um, taqwa, and all of those words mean pretty much the same thing. And it's what every human being on earth wants, ultimately. So Islam comes from the word salama, which means to be in sound condition, to be well, to be without blemish, to be safe and sound. Salim, my last name, comes from the same root. It means to be secure, to be safe, to be perfect. Iman comes from the word which means to trust, to be secure, to be in safety, security, a covenant. So again, who would not want these things? So the Quran says, I think I went a little bit further, I went a little bit too far. The Quran says in, uh, the, second, in the second surah, it says that this Quran is for those who are of the mustaqim, or the people who have taqwa, right? The root word for taqwa is to protect, to save, to preserve, to ward off, to guard against evil and calamity, to be secure, take as a shield, regarding your duties. So there's a story of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Wasallam. He's talking about a man, he was trying to explain taqwa, and he explained that a man, if he sees thorns and bushes, that he pulls his clothes close to himself, to protect himself, to guard himself and guard his clothing. So in the same sense, we are to guard our souls. The Quran says that, that we can cleanse our souls or we can dirty our souls. So it's really up to us. Allah gives us this, this predisposition towards uh, doing good and he gives us a clean, pure soul. We don't believe that you are born in sin. We we'll believe that you are born pure. And then it is up to you whether you keep that purity or if you restore that purity or not. It is up to you. You are the human being. You are capable. Just as you are capable of sinning, you are also capable of rectifying those sins by doing righteous deeds and atoning and trying to seek forgiveness when you came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So because of this taqwa, because that we guard our souls, then what, what else would we want but peace and security and safety? So again, I'm talking about this person who's in a cave or who's somewhere by himself trying to contemplate why he's on this earth and what he wants on this earth and what does anyone and everyone one want but peace, safety, security, justice, to be of sound condition. All of these things is what al-Islam is. So that human being, right from the start, would be yearning for al-Islam, right? He would be yearning to do what Allah wants him to do. And, and all of these definitions, even the definition of Salama, when it's talking about it in the, um, the Quranic dictionary, all of these things come up before submission to the will of Allah. So in order to get peace, in order to get security, in order to get safety, in order to be well and without blemish, then you submit your will to God. So Allah is saying to us in the Quran that this is how you get what you want. You get it through submission, through submission to the will of Allah. You get that safety, you get that security in that way. And again, with Iman. So I don't like the definition faith just because of the connotation that we have in America with it. Yes, sir, hold on. Go ahead. I don't like the connotation of faith just because it's generally considered like blind faith, like you're just believing because you want to believe. This is something that is not, that is not true in Al-Islam. We don't believe things because we want to believe them. We believe them because of sound reasoning. Now, this is something else that I'm going to delve in a little bit later. But just to understand the difference of Al-Islam and Iman, or a Muslim, one who submits their will to Allah and a Mu'min, one who is a believer, is that Islam is the outward uh, representation of what you do when you're submit, submitting to the will of Allah. Iman is what you feel on the inside. What, what you have on the inside, your belief, your convictions that you have, and your convictions and belief is what makes you submit to the will of Allah. So what you believe in, what you think is true, is how you act. 
So when your Iman is weak, then your Islam is weak. Right? So the more you believe in Allah, the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, the, the perfect worship is that you worship Allah as if you see him. Right? So if your Iman, if your belief and you're sincerely, we all know this, right? But then sometimes we fall, sometimes we fail. But we know Allah is seeing us and we're going to be held accountable for everything that we do. So again, your Iman, your, your inward, what is inside of you is what is, in, is your Iman and what shows outward is your Islam. But anyway, <clears throat> so from, from there, talking about the Iman and, and Islam, from there, we have what would a person who wants, submit, wants to submit their will to Allah, wants to submit themselves to the will of God, what would they do? To this creator, what would they do? They would seek guidance from that, from that being and try to figure out what does he want me to do? How does he want me to move in order to, to submit my will to the will of Allah? If we think again about that consciousness, that, uh, that conscience, or in order to do what is right, and that fitra that you have in order to lead to what is right, and you'll, you will naturally want to do something that is helpful to other people and something that doesn't harm people. It is a natural inclination, and this is the reason that there's so much commonality in our religions. It's because it's, it's already natural in us for us to want to do what is right and to know to do what is right. People that commit crimes and do bad things know they're doing something wrong, and the same way you know when you walk an old lady across the street, you know you're doing something right. So again, it is our natural inclination. So from there, Allah says that he gives us guidance. I think I may have wrote that down there somewhere. So from the word guidance, uh, the root for that means to guide, to show with kindness the right path, to lead to the right path, and to make one follow the right path. So I think we were talking the other day about caring and loving people. So um, I think we were talking about... Oh, um, so we're talking about loving people and caring about people. So if you love someone and you care about them, then you want to correct them and you want to put them on the straight path. If you see them going astray, love, real love, is correcting them even though they may be mad about it, even though they may be upset about it. So if there's a person who comes to you who's a Christian or who's a Buddhist or whomever, and they come to you sincerely wanting to give you what they believe is the truth, then they are showing their love and compassion to you. So the way we understand Allah is through his creation and how he interacts with his creation. So we know that if Allah gives us a fitrah and he gives us a predestination towards justice, then he is a just Allah. So we can, we can deduce that just from his creation. We can deduce that Allah loves us because he gives us guidance. Not only that, because he gives us more than what is necessary. It is only necessary for us to get nutrients to live it is not necessary for us to have a variety of foods or a variety of drinks or to be to able to uh, appreciate different colors and different roses and different everything. That Allah has given us the ability to appreciate these, those things and to appreciate art shows that Allah loves us and has compassion for us. And that if he gives us a fitrah that is to do what is right and to be righteous and over and over again he still gets, gives us chance after chance to do what's right then again he shows love and mercy and compassion. All of these things you can deduce again just by simply thinking. So if we realize, but particularly thinking about your mortality, and you realize that one day you're gonna die, that means every day you wake up, there's a new opportunity for you to do what is right, to you, for you to redeem yourself from what you did previously. So again, this shows the mercy of Allah, that Allah is giving us every day to think about what we did and to rectify it. He's given us more opportunity each day, every hour, every second, to rectify what we did previously. So this again talks. Of, this again exemplifies to us what Allah is and what He wants from us. None of this is something that is intricate or that is so complex that the, the earliest human beings could not have understood. Is what I'm trying to articulate to you. This Al Islam is a natural religion. So. Someone who was in a cave or someone who was in the jungle or someone who was anywhere if he was by himself or even if he was with two people or ten people they would come to these elementary conclusions so from there Allah is so if Allah is to guide us then how to, should he guide us and the Quran 
in uh, Surah Al-Fatihah, Al the Al -Fatiha, where we talked about the Surah Al Mustaqim. Surah Al comes from the root word, which means a path which is even, wide, and a way that is straight and a right path. So the saying of the Surah Al Mustaqim, meaning, meaning the path of those who earned your favor, the, the ones who were righteous, means that there were people before you that were doing what is right. So how did they know about it? How did they find out about it? And that it is a tradition of people who are doing what is right and people who want to follow that tradition. If it's their ancestors or just a different set of people who did what is right, you want to go in that direction. You want to lead as they led and follow as they follow and do what they did in order to gain favor with the law. The other word uh, um, that is spoken of in the news, news all the time is um, Sharia law, which comes from the root word, which means sh the root word, which is shara, and that is to be seated under a road, upon a road, a street. It is the right way, the clear highway or path, and it's also the definition also includes establishing a law. So sarauta is like the wide path, and then the the um, the um, Sharia is, is telling you how to stay on that path and how to stay clear of falling off of that path. So it gives you the established law of how to stay on this yellow brick road that we have in order to get to the promised land that we all are seeking. So, and how do you get there? What do they have on street signs? I mean, what do they have on roads? I think I just articulated, which is ayats, which is street signs. Ayats are signs, apparent signs, marks, indication, a message, evidence. So I talked previously about Iman. So Iman is not only faith or belief, but it is conviction. You are convinced of something. So evidence is one of the definitions of an ayah. And also proof, which means that you have the knowledge and the inclination to see the evidence and understand that it is proof of what you're trying to say. So again, Allah has given us the ability to see and distinguish truth and to be able to articulate it to other people. So this is something that Allah has naturally given us. So under, under those ayahs also is, I mean, under those definition of evidence, proof, is also miracles. So ayahs are miracles and a communication. So, and I guess more explicitly, it talks about the verses of the Quran. In it. So in talking about communication, Again, I'm talking about the natural, what is natural, a natural inclination of humanity to accept Al-Islam. So when you say that Allah communicates, right, there are people who are deists, who believe that God exists and he created the universe, but he just left it out to bear. He didn't do anything to, his commu to, to uh, communicate to his creation. Now, these people suggest it's possible that God created us by mistake. So he could just been doing something and created humanity and left them out to bear. The way to understand that that is not true, especially with modern science, is if we think about our DNA. So in your DNA is, has the inf more information than Encyclopedia Britannica. And it is discoverable information, which means that it is categorized in a certain way, and it is meant for you to discover it. So if I have a tree and I put Ismael Bilal Salim was here, me doing that indicates to someone else that I was there, right? And it also means that I have the inclination that they will know what those words mean and understand them. So when Allah puts in our DNA all of, our, all of the information of our human selves and, we, and it is discoverable, that means Allah is communicating to us, literally, right? So he is saying, he's showing his creative ability through his DNA. It is so, and then just the fact that it is information is one thing. So if you have an Encyclopedia Britannica on the ground somewhere in the middle of the desert, no one would think that it came about accidentally. Right? If you saw an encyclopedia with A through Z and everything you need to know about it, from, um, from ants to zoos to zoology, everywhere about the whole human existence is in the Encyclopedia Britannica. So all of that information is already inside of you. Would anyone believe that that came about accidentally? 
So not only is it information, it again is discoverable information, and it is organized information. All of these things, again, tell us that Allah is a true, is the true creator, that we did not come about by accident, and that Allah is still having purpose for us. He's still having something in us that is discoverable, which means he's communicating with us. So not only is Allah communicating with us as we believe through our through ourselves and through our creation, but he literally communicates through us through the Quran. So from there, the next word is wahi. So is the and the root word for that means to indicate, to reveal, to suggest, to point out. It also means to dispatch a messenger, to inspire. It also means revelation or inspiration. Uh, and the final thing it says in the definition is to say something into in a whisper so that only the hearer will hear it. So we know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received his revelation in that way. That the crowd or the audience didn't understand what was going on, but he could, he could get the revelation from the angel Jibreel, and from there he spoke these words to us. So, and there are, obviously we know that there are ample uh, examples in the Quran of scientific, of historic uh, evidence, that suggests that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not able to know any of these things, but he did know them. So again, this a kind of attests to where did this information come from if he was not able to get this information. There's one instance we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the kings and pharaohs, and that in the time of Musa Alayhi Salam, it mentions pharaohs, but in the time of Yusuf Alayhi Salam, it says kings. Now, how would Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam know that distinction unless he went into a, a, a pyramid and figured out hieroglyphic, hieroglyphics in order to make that distinction? Again, uh, that's kind of going off my point here. My point is that it's a natural, natural religion. So what I'm saying is that Allah, that any person who sat and thought, they would think that Allah has given them guidance. And the reason that we would also think that he's given us guidance is from what we also have of of knowledge. So the root word for knowledge, it means to mark, to sign, or to distinguish. So the one of the primary purposes of our mind, of our brain, of our thinking, is to distinguish right from wrong, good from bad, to make proper distinctions between what should the path I should go and the path that I shouldn't go. So Allah, as the creator, he knows his creation. And again, we understand him and that he has given us knowledge and the ability to distinguish things. So that means that the Creator wants us to decide what is right from wrong. He wants us to be a thinking people, an investigating people, a researching people. And again, this is without the Quran. You could just ponder this on your own just from understanding that Allah has given us knowledge and the ability to discern knowledge. From there, we get what is uh, the root word for aqla. And it means to bind, to keep back, to be intelligent, to become wise, meaning it's a process to understand, to use understanding. So in other words, this is a reasoning. The other word that it means is to abstain. And we abstain because we understand. Because we have understanding is why we abstain from things. I'll give you an example of that. So I think that we shouldn't teach um, that in order to, if I always thought about I had a daughter, right? So I have three sons and I was so concerned that I was gonna have a daughter and how I would uh, raise her, just in this society today. And I thought that I should teach her about value, not necessarily about abstinence. Because if she values herself, then she will abstain. She will abstain from doing things that she shouldn't do. So if we understand our own value, and that Allah values us, and, and created us on purpose, and with a purpose, then we will act accordingly. So again, as I said, with our Iman, with our conviction, with our understanding, from there is how we act and how our outward al-Islam is personified. So if we have a deep understanding, a deep belief, and we understand that Allah values us, then we will act accordingly. So if you do things that are incorrect, it's probably because of your iman is weak and it needs to be strengthened in whatever area. So, um, knowledge and reasoning, all of these things, again, are something that we have naturally been been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, these are things that you can just be at your, be in a cave, be somewhere by yourself and still come up with these inclinations that we have knowledge and we have understanding, which means the creator 
wanted us to understand and to know and to research. And then from there, we have examples. So from the, the root word for example is the word model, uh, to be an imitation, to be a pattern, to relief, and to be an example worthy of imitation. So uh, I like basketball, right? So I like Kobe Bryant, and people always talk about how he stole everything from Michael Jordan, right? He eats, he chews his gum like him, he dribbles like him, he does all those things. Michael Jordan said, they asked him who would be able to beat him that's playing basketball now. He said, probably Kobe, because Kobe stole all my moves from me. But he said, he always gives Kobe some, um, some recognition because he knows the, I guess, the struggle it takes in order to imitate him, to be as he was. So he understands and he appreciates that Kobe Bryant saw that he was worthy of imitation. He was so good that I should do exactly what he did. I should chew my gum like him. I should play basketball like him. So human beings and Muslims, we all know that there is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was the supreme example for us to be, to uh, exemplify. And the, Prophet, and the law has given us examples uh, that we can, this example that we can follow. And I thought one of the words for it was relief also, because I thought we talked about previously about a test. If this life is a test that Allah has given us, then you feel comfort, you feel relief, and you have an example, someone who has been through what we've been through, and we can look to him for the answers. So you aren't stressed out before the test. Because, again, you know all the answers. So Allah not only gave you the answers to the test, he gave you an example of showing you how the test should be performed. So we should be the most at ease. In fact, there's a study that was particularly done just about religious people, people who have deep religious uh, beliefs, and they are less depressed than people who don't. And this is because they are, they are anxious. They have anxiety because they don't know why they're here or what the, what's the reason that they are here for. They have, the ans they have the questions and no answers to them when we have the answers to those questions and this is why we are less likely to drink, less likely to smoke, less likely to have depression, to do all those things that are self-destructive because one, we realize that the creator of the universe created us and he has a purpose for us and that our purpose again is in doing what is righteous and being righteous. So I think, um, I think that was, oh, the last thing I want to talk about was our soul, so um, or about jihad, which comes from the root word jihada, which means to toil, to exert strenuously, to be diligent, to struggle, and to strive. So the purpose of this talk was to suggest that al-Islam was a natural religion, that if you were to sit and ponder over this, you would come to the conclusion that Allah has created you and he wants you to worship him. So I think that was the other thing I missed. I did miss that. So worship means to serve, to worship, to adore, to venerate, to submit, to devote yourself. So all of these things would be a natural inclination when you realize that Allah has given you life and everything around you, every experience that you have, Allah has created it for you. And every day he has given you the opportunity to better yourself. So again, this shows the mercy that Allah has on us, that he is ultimately worthy of our worship, worthy of our praise because we were nothing, we were non-existent, and then Allah gave us the opportunity to be righteous, to be great, to make a change for what is positive in this world. So when we talk about our, our soul, ourselves and our souls, and we struggle and strive to keep ourselves on this right path, to have this fitra and to stay on the right path that Allah, that the Creator has given us, then we have what is jihad, what is a struggle. And again, this as a natural inclination, every human being on earth struggles and strives. So it's that, so my, my teacher is here, uh, and I, I wanted to tell you that you inspired this talk today when we were talking about, I was, when we were talking yesterday about um, Salam and uh, Iman, Amina, and all of those meaning security and peace and taqwa, all of those coming from these root words that means peace and security and safety and justice is something that everyone has a natural inclination for. So what the Quran does, what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does is gives us the, the tangible way to do that. 
So if we were, like I was talking about this in natural religion, so if we were to ponder those things, we would come up with that we should pray to God, that we should uh, do something, maybe give some sacrifices to God. But the religion part of it tells us how we have unity, how we are one, and how we can move as one to make a difference in this world. So people today have an issue with religion, and they talk about spirituality. But I don't think you can have one without the other, or it won't be as potent without the other. There is something in Al-Islam that makes people pray when they're sleepy, when they're tired, when they don't want to do anything else, they get off of work, but the praise to Allah and the understanding that you should praise him because he created you, because he is so merciful to you, can only be done by religion, not by spirituality. So when, a, when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi gives us the guidelines and rules and, and manner in which to worship him, we can all do it in solidarity. Because if we do it individually, everybody will be doing everything differently. How is it that, how could it possibly be that we all pray in unison at the same time during the same, during, this, during the same day, or that during the same month we all give a sacrifice to Allah, or that we pay our zakat, and we want to feed the homeless, and we want to guide those who are, are traveling, we want to aid those who are traveling. Nothing can do that but the solidarity of this religion. So when Allah, He, he gives us communication through just uh, generic, or, uh, generic communication, but with the specific communication is how we are able to be as one and to move forward and to change society and to change the universe. As I said initially, we are walking, talking mud, right? Allah has given mud animation to be able to not only talk, to articulate, to explain to you my thoughts. So I've been reading lately this guy, Noam Chomsky, and he's talking about language. He's a linguist. Um, by trade, and he's talking about language, and he's saying that a baby, right, so I got a two-year-old baby, and it's so amazing how he learns different words, and he says, this man is probably agnostic, he doesn't believe in God, but whenever he, you ask him about God, he starts talking about a personal God, so no one disagrees with the Creator. I don't believe it. I've never talked to someone who said it was an atheist, and then when I break it down to there was nothing, and then there was something, they don't say, they don't say well, I just believe it was nothing, right? So what they always argue is a personal God, which I just told you that it's inside of our DNA, we have information. So that is a personal God, whether they want to deny that or not. But at any rate, he was saying that the words that the child learns, he learns them almost instinctively from hearing it one time. And when we talk, he says that, like right now, and I always do this, I'm trying to figure out the right word to say, which means the right words are already somewhere in my mind, and I'm trying to figure out the right word to say. He said that means that we are, we are programmed as human beings to, to know language and to understand language, and we already have the ideas in our mind. I'm just trying to articulate them to you. That he does not believe in God is completely outrageous to me when, he's, when he says out of his mouth, literally, he said that we are programmed like a computer already. So my son, I say go, or I say bye, or say hi, or whatever, he just picks it up, and then that he picks it up after one or two times, he says that means that it was already in his mind somewhere. And then he found it and kept it and started saying it. I'm like, again, submission to the will of Allah Believing in Allah and doing what is right is something that is natural to us. It is a natural inclination for us to accept Al-Islam. There's, a, there's a, a guy who's a, who does rap. He's from um, England. His name is Muslim Bilal, right? Muslim Bilal says that he accepted Al-Islam as soon as someone told him about it. He said, and he says in one of his raps, he said, why didn't you tell me about this religion in the first place? Like, if you tell me that there's a religion about submitting their will to the Creator, why wouldn't I believe in it? What other religion could be true? So he said, he was, he was saying basically, you should have told me about this a long time ago. I would have been a Muslim a long time ago. So when people accept Al-Islam and they understand what Al-Islam means, they realize that they are fulfilling their own purpose that Allah has given them.
Slim will do. Slim will do. Any questions? I think it would be a statement. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about the hereafter. Yes, sir. Uh, a little while back, there was a, there was a demand from a, that used to be here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's a DB stand. And someone asked him about the here. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't answer the question, but he said, uh, he didn't know he could answer the question, but he know for, he, he don't believe that if you don't enter the here after in this world, chances are you won't, in, 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 you won't, you won't be in here after in the life of your, in, in, in the afterlife, you die physically. I don't know what he meant, meant by, by, by that question. And I didn't mention the hereafter, but I should have. You, you remind me of something that I should have said. Let me, let, let me explain. Yes, sir. Before coming into Islam, mm -hmm. there was a life. We, we lived a different oh, life. Okay, okay, I see what you're saying, yes, sir. The life we live now should be the life of a righteous Muslim. Absolutely. This is the hereafter, the life after that life. Mm -hmm. Sure. And it, 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 there's only two hereafter here after that I know of. The life after living the life that, we, that they lived before, mm -hmm. and then coming a Muslim, mm -hmm. and then a life with Allah forever. Sure. That's in Allah's memory mm -hmm. after, after the physical death. Mm -hmm. That's sure. what I want to say. I understand what you're saying perfectly. I don't know what the Imam, maybe he misunderstood what you were saying. No, he, he didn't know what I was saying. No, he, he, didn't know. he understood me exactly. Mm -hmm. The point of the matter is we've been laid astray. We've been letting people out, letting people form my opinion instead of praying to Allah for guidance. Mm -hmm. We've been looking to other people. Mm -hmm. Islam is common sense. Mm -hmm. You heard of all downs, right? Yes, sir. When people get a blow in the head. Now, that's not the arm of the house of Alzheimer's. But when people get a blow in the head, they call them amnesia. Mm -hmm. Okay? They lose part of their memory. Some people lose all of their memory. Mm -hmm. They say that you lost your mind. Mm -hmm. And then they expect us to believe that when we die physically with no brain, we're going to have full consciousness of what's going on with no senses, no physical senses whatsoever. No life whatsoever. The life with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter <clears throat> is in his memory. Sure. So this is why we should be, be a righteous Muslim, live the best we can. So when we, this physical body die, we will, we will forever live with Allah in his memory as being among the righteous. That's what I'm going to say. Yes, sir. I do remember, I did mention about the hereafter and then I was talking about, um, I can't remember what I was talking about. Oh, um, I can't remember what I was saying. But at any rate, maybe it'll come to me while I'm talking. What I meant to say, what I wanted to uh, include in this, that in our memories, right? So when you're a child, or now, right now, if there's a song that comes up, you remember what's going on in that time, right? You can, I can smell something and it reminds me of something that happened when I was a small child, which means that our memory is in storage, right? That means that it's in there somewhere, we just can't recall it. The same thing I was talking about with language. It's in there somewhere. And what do, why do we put things in storage but to bring it out and use it again? I know what I was talking about. I was talking about we will be testifying against ourselves. And I was saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use our physical selves to testify against us. This, again, is further proof in that in our memories, we have everything that we've ever done, which also speaks to justice in that the most just that anyone can be is someone who knows everything, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he brings the... The, the eyewitness is you against your own self. How possible can you refuse it? <laughs> so that we have a memory is also indicative that of the fact that we will have to stand in justice. Allah will make us uh, be held accountable for what we did if we did not atone for what we did. So that the brother was talking about that. I know, I think you're talking about a whole set of people and I think he's not of African-American persuasion, so that's possibly why he didn't understand what you were saying or what you were articulating. But I understand what you're saying now, particularly. And, and, or that could be with anyone. If they are dead mentally and then they understand al-Islam and then they are alive, then that is one form of being, being dead and being alive. But then there's another one about us actually dying. And that's, that's what I want to start. And I, I also should articulate in that from the beginning, I said we're talking about a natural religion but I start off with the supernatural, so it's kind of counterintuitive. But the reason that is, is because as a natural person, you realize that something supernatural had to create you. Something that was not in nature, something that is not susceptible to the laws that we are susceptible to, created us. So that 
is also proof or also evidence of a natural religion. If you, are, if you think naturally, you know that something that is not in this universe, that is not susceptible to time and space and the laws of gravity and the laws of cause and effect, cause, cause. It created creation. So that first creator created everything. So all of those are intuitive to the natural understanding of religion, the natural inclination towards submitting yourself to the will of Allah. And uh, I hope I answered your question. If you no, I, I really didn't have a question. I had a, I had a statement. Yes, sir. I'm trying to clarify mm -hmm. the two, the two hereafters. Mm -hmm. A life here, given the life of a Muslim, mm -hmm. and a life forever with Allah in his memory. Mm -hmm. Because as individuals, you might not have no consciousness. Mm -hmm. The Bible says a, a live dog is better than a dead lion. <laughs> so the living, there's hope, but they don't just die. Mm -hmm. But the dead don't like anything. So we, we must strive hard to leave a, 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 a legacy mm -hmm. with Allah as being among the righteous and being a good example and doing all we can to help elevate each other. That's what I'm saying. So that um, also comes up with the idea even in Christianity of uh, being born again is that you have a rebirth. But the actual, I think the actual and the literal definition of the word that he used meant born from above meaning that you have elevated yourself from what you were previously. And everyone can understand that if you are on a low level, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do. That's why we have this fitra, and that's why you have this consciousness, or this conscience. I saw someone saying, I don't believe in religion because religion makes you feel guilty. I said, if you did something wrong, you should feel guilty, right? The reason you wanna, you wanna take that guilt away so you can go on doing what you're doing. But it's naturally in you to understand what is right and what is good and what is, and what is wrong and to abstain from those things. But you want to absolve yourself of those things so then you can say, well, I can do what I want to. That's the reason why it's such a huge push towards taking out God and not talking about God or anything that God wants you to do. That is some natural spirituality that you think of yourself. But again, if you said think by yourself, you still would come up with Alice Islam. Yes, sir. I, I, I could so, so mm -hmm. um, bear witness to that. Um, there's a word that you was talking about it, it meant um, incomprehensible. I can't remember mm -hmm. which word that was. Guy. Guy, right? Yeah. Okay, so as you know, me and you discussed, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, was, I was an atheist. And um, my hang up, the reason I can bear witness to that is my hang up was that. At that point of what you talked about, non-existence, mm -hmm. that in order for existence to take place, there would have to be some sort of substance. Mm -hmm. And um, in my mind, I was refusing to bear witness that it was something that I couldn't comprehend, mm -hmm. right? Because outside of that substance, there's nothing that exists. That was my mind frame. And outside of that substance, there's nothing that could exist. It wasn't until that I was that I was like, you know what? That I submitted to the idea that I didn't, that I couldn't comprehend something. Is that when I was like, all right, this God mm -hmm. exists, right? Mm -hmm. But there's, so the reason we have the 99 attributes of Allah is to help us understand what Allah is. And we can understand it through how, through his creation. That's what I was talking about when I was saying, like we understand that Allah is one that wants justice because he has given us a consciousness. He has given us a fitra or predisposition towards doing what is righteous. He loves us. We can see from his creation and how he has created us and given us opportunity time after time, which means he is compassionate, he's merciful, he's all those things. So we can derive those things. Yes, sir. We can derive those things just from thinking about them. Like you were saying, so I don't, even if you are an atheist, right? If you are sincere, I don't disagree with anyone, or I don't think it's wrong to be uh, an atheist if you are sincere, because I think ultimately, if you are sincere, you will sincerely come to the truth. So, and, and this, is, this is what happened, right? So if you are sincere about yourself, and the other reason I wanted to do it this way was because I want there to be no doubt that Allah, or that, that Allah exists, that God exists. So, like I was saying, people always talk about a personal God. And they, the reason they do that is because they were like, well, God, is, 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 he is he benevolent? Why is he letting bad things happen in the world? 
So if you start off with a creator, that there was nothing and then he created everything and there was no life and then there was life, then you have to start off with a given that God exists. And then you explain why you think he was benevolent or malevolent. So that you are mad at God or that you have a problem with God does not deny the existence of God. So that's the reason I, I try to start off with that. Like, so then from there, okay, God exists. Now try to figure out what he wants me to do and why he's letting this world be the way it is. So the, que the answer to that question, just in case you are inquisitive about it, at least what I say is the reason that there is bad in the world is the same reason that there is good in the world. Do you attribute good? If I did something good and I went and saved some people, who, I saved a lady that was um, walking down the street. She almost got hit by a car. Allah has given me the opportunity. Like I said, this, is, this life is a test. He's given me the opportunity to do what's right or to do what's wrong. It is Allah's inspiration that helps me do what is right and his guidance would aids me into doing what is right. But ultimately, it was my decision to do what was right or what was wrong. When there are people who, when there are babies that are born that are deformed, right? The reason that happens is because of a human being. A crack baby came from a crack mother, right? So in order to fix the, the, the human problem can be fixed by the human person. So if we, if we rectify what is, or is, is the problem, if we look into a higher power, it's almost like uh, the savior mentality again, that you're looking, for oh God, come down, please come and save me. When the problem was created by human beings, I think Nelson Mandela said that uh, hatred in the world came from human beings, so love should also come from human beings, or he said something to that effect. If we want to stop racism, if we want to stop injustice, we have to stop it. Allah has given us the tools to do it, but we got to do it ourselves. We can't say, oh, when is Allah coming down here, and when is he going to change these things? We know, right, that Allah changes your condition when you change what's in your heart and change what's in yourself. That's the whole thing of jihad is that you, it's a struggle. You have to struggle. You can't wait and say, I don't see what happens, right? Our religion doesn't teach that at all. We, oppression is worse than death, which means sometimes you're going to have to die fighting oppression, right? So that's the way it is. And because we believe in the hereafter and because we believe we will be rewarded for these deeds, this again goes to justice and since we know that the Creator is a just God, then ultimately our ultimate justice will be with Him. Since He is the one that has the testimony, and He is the one who has us as our witnesses, He is the one who is the most just. So Adolf Hitler, when he died and wasn't punished, he's getting punished. Whatever, if you believe in a religion that doesn't uh, understand or believe in the hereafter, then he went scot free. Right? He committed his crimes and he killed himself. Right? Or anything that we do, all the the reason that we do righteous deeds and don't tell anybody about it because we know ultimately Allah sees that and we will get the reward that we have for that whether anybody else sees it or anybody else knows it. The same thing is true of whatever the sin is. We know Allah sees it, right? So we have to rectify that. Any other questions? Uh, I, I saw that, uh, you know, we've been taught and I'd like to add that uh, just, just to add some more information to why Allah allows things to happen. Mm -hmm. And so that you can see his attributes come out. In other words, if everything was perfect all the time, he never hear, mm -hmm. you never see his mercy, mm -hmm. you never see his uh, forgiveness, or none of that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, was, that was just the sure. attitude of what you were saying. Appreciate yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So the, the reason that this comes out, at least in current times in social media, is with African Americans. So why, so these, these African Americans pray to God, they pray to Jesus, they pray to everybody, why isn't that God coming to save them? Uh, and then with that reasoning, they say, that's why, that's why I don't believe in God. That's why I'm an atheist. That, what I'm saying is, that's the reason that I want to accentuate that the creator exists no matter what. Now you, try to, now you have to figure out why the situation is. The situation is the way it is because some wicked people did something bad, and righteous people sat and did nothing. Oh, yeah. In order to fix that, then the, the righteous people have to do something. That's a, that's a very good presentation. Thank you very much. I want to say something that I, I was thinking when you were talking about how people are looking for that peace and looking for this. And I'm sometimes thinking people don't even know what they're looking for, but I'm, I think sometimes you come to an age where you just feel a void mm -hmm. yeah. when you don't have uh, a lot in your life. Mm -hmm. I think people come to a place where there's a void and they don't know what it is exactly, they just you know, they don't feel complete. Mm -hmm. I think that's the reason why it's important that we do dawah, right? Because dawah is an invitation, right? But nobody, 
we aren't, hopefully we don't think that when we send this invitation, somebody will come right here and be a Muslim. That invitation you extend out, may, they may not come until 20 years from now. But if you don't give them that invitation, somebody else sends it and they'll go there. When that void comes and someone from uh, another religion gave them an invitation, that's where they're going to go. That's why it's important that we give da'wah and we try to bring as many people in here as possible because one day they're going to realize that they need a lot. Yes. That's what I'm going to Forgive me for not being here for your whole presentation, but I want earlier when you were talking about um, the different separation between the physical self and the soul and when Allah has given us this rule, mm -hmm. it was amazing to me. I started thinking about how um, and each one of us has our own pre, what did you say? Pre, uh, predisposition towards it? Yes. So, so what a blessing <laughs> it is, you know, and if you just think about how enormous that is, like I don't have to act like you, you don't have to act like me, but we both have the blessings of Allah to do whatever it is that we need to do. It just, you know, it just struck me. Sometimes you don't think about how big things are, you know, because we're so busy thinking mm -hmm. about how important we are in the scheme of things. But when we stop and think about, like, like if that little thing right there mm -hmm. is just so enormous. It is so enormous, and uh, I didn't, I wasn't laughing at you. It just makes me feel, I, I'm overjoyed when I think about that, because mm -hmm. I think about people who, believe that this world is created without purpose. And a lot of people out here without any purpose in their life. And it's either they believe that they're, if they're atheists, agnostic, or people who just believe that God created us and left us out to bear. Like you're saying, we are all individually different, which means that if, if there was a tornado and it created a bunch of robots, all the robots would say, I am going down the street or whatever, right? But all of us are distinct and different and different thinking. That's like so profound that Allah made us different, like our fingertips, right? Mm -hmm. Down to our fingertips that we are so intricately different, but we all can be one in unison and in one direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm.